Hey guys, it's Dante at Ferrigno Freedom Channel coming back to talk to you again about carnivore living and carnivore diet. And today I want to talk about blood iron levels. You know, this is something that's been a bit of a mystery to me. I've had a few people that have commented in the past that have asked about blood iron levels. They want to know if I have a lot of iron in my blood. And I hadn't really given it much thought because I hadn't had any problems. But it's one of those things where it's been in the back of my mind that I need to probably understand a little bit about this because if it's going around the community where they're wanting to ask these questions, then maybe it's something that I need to be able to shed a little bit of light on, especially with my experience in two and a half years of doing lion diet. You know, all I eat is beef for the most part. Occasionally I have lamb or deer and some other ruminant animals, but I tend to avoid pork, chicken, and seafood, but when somebody eats a lot of red meat, you tend to think, well, their iron is going to be really high. And I figured after two years, that would be long enough to know whether or not my iron level was high. But it was something that a doctor hadn't checked for for me in the past. So I thought this is something that I really probably need to look into so I can shed a little light on it for you guys. And it, my opportunity finally came because something that my work does that I'm really thankful for is that they, they encourage us to do things that are healthy for ourselves and also encourage good health among our community. And that includes donating blood. They actually give us rewards for doing things that are health conscious and donating blood is one of the things that they give us a high reward for, which is really nice of them. Because normally I, I was not a big fan of donating blood. First of all, I'm not 100% sure what some of the sources do with the blood. But at the same time, I always knew that sometimes people need transfusions. Sometimes people get in car accidents and they need a certain type of blood to be able to stay alive while the doctors surgically put them back together. So I wanted to be able to donate blood. But I always used to have this thing about needles. And it was just one of those things that I never wound up doing. Unless I was really down on my luck and needed a few extra bucks. And back in the day, it seems like you could actually get enough money to pay a bill <laughs> donating blood. These days, it's like you can get a quarter tank of gas or a trinket. But donating blood hasn't appealed to me very much generally in my life. When I found out that donating blood is a good way to get your iron level under control... Because your body has to produce more blood and it gets rid of some iron during the process. I thought, well, this will be an interesting thing. Maybe I'll be able to find out what my iron level is. And then I learned something about iron levels that's really confusing. There seems to be two complete different scales for checking iron. Because the numbers that they use at the one blood office that I go to for blood donations are much lower numbers than are indicated by when I do research online about what blood serum levels of iron would be. And I've come to determine that it has to do with whether or not they're actually checking the blood itself for iron content or if they're using a device that they put on the end of your finger to check for iron content. It's not like an oximeter that checks for oxygen levels. It actually kind of moves around a little bit. You can feel it adjusting on your finger or on your thumb. I think they put it on my thumb last time I was there. And it checks for the iron level. And the last two times I went, I was both within the normal range. And that's the first two times I've given blood that I can remember. So I thought it would be a good idea to take a look at a video that talks about carnivore diet, blood levels of iron, and even donating blood. And I found a video that looks like it might be very interesting. And it's by a, one of our favorite carnivore doctors, Dr. Paul Saladino. It's called Managing Iron Overload with Phlebotomy. And if you're not aware, phlebotomy is basically the, the field of, that deals with donating or receiving blood. And in this case, I'm sure he's talking about donating blood. So I'm assuming that's going to be where the video is going to take us, and it's going to deal with some of the aspects of carnivore, iron levels, and donating blood. So without any further ado, let's take a look at that, and I'll add my commentary as we go and see if there's anything we can glean from this that'll be helpful for all of you on your carnivore journey. And let's roll. So the basic gist here is that my sex hormone binding globulin, which is a protein in the human blood, like albumin, that carries our sex hormones, 
has been elevated for a long time. And when I was on keto, my SHBG was in the 120s at one time. So low carb appears to raise SHBG. This is an argument that I've advanced in the past that is probably that ketogenic low carb diets are not great for sex hormones because when you have more SHBG, you're going to have less free hormones in your body. And so I was wondering why is my SHBG so high? I experimented with things like boron, didn't really change anything. And I'm not sure that's the right solution either. I think I'm getting plenty of boron in my diet. I stumbled upon this idea that perhaps my SHBG was elevated because perhaps I had a little bit too much iron in my blood. As I've talked about in the past, I don't have hemochromatosis. I don't have genes for hemochromatosis. I've shown my genes on previous podcasts, but I do seem to hold on to iron when I eat meat every day. And to be fair, this is a reason that some people may argue, Paul, isn't this an impetus to eat less red meat with all of this bioavailable heme iron? And I don't really think it is because here's the short answer. I think red meat, especially grass-fed red meat, is probably the most evolutionarily consistent food we could eat because it's fed the most ancestrally evolutionarily consistent diet. Cows are fed grass throughout their lives, and that grass is what they're supposed to be eating. I don't really want to eat lower iron containing chicken that is fed corn and soy and grains. If I eat the dark meat, I'm gonna get a similar amount of heme iron as I am with red meat. If I eat darker pork, I'm gonna get that, but both pork and chicken are fed corn and soy, and I don't wanna eat those foods. I would rather eat red meat and then understand where my iron is and manage it. How do I manage it? Well, this may sound a little intense, but I've been doing phlebotomy. So this means I essentially drain a little bit of blood every week. And if you've heard my previous podcast, what have I started doing? Yeah, I do my own blood draws. So every week I stick a needle in my vein, usually right there. And I drain out 50 to 60 cc's of blood, which I then give to that plant behind me, which is maybe why it looks so healthy. And (laughs) as you can see, my ferritin, I'll show you the ferritin levels have gone down significantly with that process. And interestingly, and this is really the first time that I'm able to share this on blood work, my SHBG has now also gone down to the lowest levels that I've had, perhaps since I've been checking it in the last four to five years. So I really think that there is interesting evidence in the medical literature that subclinical iron overload may lead to levels of sex hormone binding globulin that are higher than we want to see it. So let's get into the details of all that and I'll show you guys how it all shakes out. So you can- All right, that's- There's a lot of interesting stuff that he covered there. First of all, I'm not one to be draining my own blood. (laughs) Um, I, I, I go to a blood drive clinic. I go to One Blood here in Florida. I think they're also in Georgia. And I know they provide blood for the local hospitals that, that need blood for people. So I, I feel real comfortable dealing with this particular place that handles blood draws. And the, the good thing is, is that even though like the first time I ever went, they said that my my blood iron level was 17.1. And on their scale, it shows that between 14 and 18 is normal for a male. So I thought, well, that's that sounds pretty good. But I didn't understand what the numbers meant. And I, I really still don't understand what their numbers mean. I am trying to dig into this information. So once you're over 18 or under 14, They don't really want to take your blood because you're either iron deficient or you have too much iron in your blood. And that's the first time I had anything looked at when it came to my iron. So I thought, well, if it's 17.1 now, I wonder how it's going to be the next time I give blood. So yesterday was the first opportunity I've had to give blood again and find out what the reading would be. And this time, my blood iron level was 15.5. So... Close, I guess that's just below the midway point of what they consider normal for an adult male. And I thought, well, that's that sounds like that's a much better place to be as far as iron goes. I didn't want to be on the high side necessarily because then I thought, well, what if it pushes over the level? Am I working on getting hemochromatosis? Am I having to worry about having high iron issues? And he was talking about how having high iron can affect your sex hormone uh, I forget the four letters that he just mentioned, but I understand that when you have more of that particular thing that he was talking about, that it it inhibits your sexual production, 
Well, I haven't had any problems in that area, especially for those of you who don't know, I was on TRT when I started doing Lion Diet, but I've been able to come off of TRT. And not only was my initial blood test after having been off of TRT for six months that my testosterone numbers were where they were four years ago when I started TRT. The doctor said that that would be unlikely that they would even be as high as they were because my body hadn't been producing as much of its own because I had been supplementing for close to four years. So that was the first step. Then I started supplementing with iodine because I realized that I was iodine deficient. I had been supplementing with iodine for about six or seven months by the time I took my next blood test. And that one showed that my testosterone levels were normal now. They had gone up by over 50% from the last number. Now, I understand that free testosterone makes a bigger indicator of whether or not you're having uh, good testosterone levels. But as I've mentioned in the past, the problem that I started testosterone for was no longer a problem. And that was related to performance in the bedroom. And it's still no longer a problem. And I, I'm just curious, now that I'm finding out that lower iron levels might actually help with that, that, that could be an interesting side note. I mean, I'm, I'm not even really sure where to go with what he's said here so far, but I wanted to be able to kind of keep us on track so we can see how this is all going to play out with iron levels. Here that on these most recent labs in March 2023, my ferritin is now 87 previously 252 and before 252 it was above 300 so 300 doesn't really raise the alarm you can see here that the reference interval for ferritin is 30 to 400 nanograms per ml but for me it seems that things are better in my physiology when my ferritin is a little lower Perhaps my ancestors just didn't have quite as much access to red meat as I did. And so when they got iron, they wanted to really hold on to it because it's such a precious nutrient. Iron forms the center of every hemoglobin molecule in your body, which is the large complex of proteins in all of your red blood cells that carry oxygen. It's a pretty central thing for being a healthy human. So if you perhaps didn't have access to lots of iron in the past, half of my ancestry is Sicilian, then holding on to iron may have been a good thing. So I realized that as we move through time and space in 2023, we may do things differently than our ancestors had. And I'm trying to do that in the best way possible, eating the cleanest, most nutrient rich foods, but also mitigating potential issues with um, genetics that may not be ideal. Now, hundreds of years ago, my ancestors might've been eating more fish. Maybe they were eating more land animals like chicken or pork, and they may have had less iron in their diets. If <laughs> those animals were not fed suboptimal foods, maybe that would be something that I could consider an experiment with. But I feel pretty darn good with meat and organs. I just do this phlebotomy to manage my ferritin. So it's an interesting thing. It's humbling for me to say, oh, I don't think this is a reason for humans not to eat good quality red meat, grass fed, grass finished. But I think it's something to know and you should check your iron stores. You can see here the whole iron panel you want is going to have the iron binding capacity, which is called the TIBC, uh, serum iron and iron saturation which is 35, previously 31. I've had that as high as almost 50 in the past. So you want that iron saturation below 40 for sure. You want that ferritin. I would say the ferritin can go even lower for me, probably 60 or 70 or even 50. And those are the main iron stores. Those are the main iron metrics that you wanna get on your labs. You'll see here on the blood work that my B12 is out of the reference range, but this is a normal thing for me. And it happens for many humans who are eating red meat and organs, animal foods that has lots of B12. That's nothing to be concerned about. There is some association in the literature. There, there are some conditions where people have myeloid dysplasia or blood cancers that lead to elevated B12, but you can easily see on a CBC that I don't have any blood cancer. This is just an elevated storage amount of B12, which is completely safe from everything we know in medicine and not an issue. You can see my folate is 6.7, previously 15.7. Not sure why it's lower, but it's still within the reference range and I am eating a little more liver now, which is good as you'll see later on my homocysteine. So we can also look then at my sex hormone binding globulin. SHBG is here, 50.2, previously 69.5 in November. So this is November to March with basically weekly phlebotomy, 50 to 60 cc's of blood. 
led to a drop in the SHBG, probably between 69.5 and 50.2, with a ferritin that went down from 252 to 87. So I'll keep an eye on this, but I think that's really interesting. And obviously, this isn't a perfect experiment. There's no way I could blind myself. But I do think that I feel better with less iron. I feel better with probably a lower ferritin now. And perhaps the sex drive is a little better for me with less ferritin, though the testosterone has remained about the same. Well, that was quick. I'm uh, a little surprised at how quickly that went by, but he was talking about a lot of things that just kind of went right over my head. But I will say that you know, the idea of having high iron is definitely not a good long-term thing to have too high of an iron. So far in two years, I haven't had anything come up on my blood work that indicated I had high iron. Do I know if they even checked it? I really don't. Because I'm like you in a lot of ways and a lot of people out there, I get the blood work my doctor recommends. And it hasn't been something that I've been able to really delve into yet. Hopefully in the near future, I'll be able to do a lot more with blood work for you where I can get something going on with a, a local lab or something like that. But right now, the prices on getting blood work done that I've seen is just for the things that I want to pick out. It's a little expensive on my side. But what I have been able to find out is that donating blood helps reduce your iron level in your in your blood because just in the eight weeks between my two donations I went from 17.1 to 15.5 grams per milliliter or whatever it is <laughs> I forget deciliter or something like that but anyway just the fact that it's gone to below the middle of the normal range according to uh, one blood tells me a little bit about the fact that one my blood iron level wasn't higher than normal, not so high that they couldn't accept my blood, which was a good thing. And then on top of that, it went down between the two blood draws. One of the other things I've noticed is that being on a carnivore diet, I don't have any issues when I give blood where I feel weak or tired afterward. Uh, both times that I gave blood in the past eight weeks, I was able to go on to work the first time and not have any issues whatsoever. As a matter of fact, Yesterday, when I went for my blood draw, I hadn't eaten all day. And I hear that that's an issue for some people. I had, I take it back. I had three poached eggs around 11 o'clock, and I went and gave blood at 3.30. I actually wound up giving blood around 4 o'clock because it takes a while for them to process you and come in. But, you know, it's just, it's a miracle what lion diet, what carnivore diet in general has done for me and a lot of other people. And being able to participate in giving blood is definitely a positive side for, for me. And knowing that I'm not getting too much iron is a good thing. And I thought it would be good to be able to share with you since I'd had so many questions about iron. Hopefully one day I'll be able to get all the checks that he talked about, like ferritin and uh, getting the overall iron level and then checking the sex hormone binding gobulin and all that stuff. Hopefully, but I'm not there yet. But for now, I just want to say that you can control your iron levels a little bit by giving blood. So no worries with iron. No worries with uh, eating all red meat, which is what I eat 100% of the time. But I do hope to come back with more information on that for you in, in, a, in a near future video. For now, if you wouldn't mind, stick around. You can check out one of my affiliates. I'm going to show you something from Redmond Real Salt, my favorite company to buy salt from. Not only do I love their smoke salts, but I love the kosher salt. I love their fine salt. I get the little tiny bottles just so I can keep them with me when I go out and I have them ready to go. Even though the, the when you order a little package of their tiny bottles, it seems like this is a lot for a little but it just, it's nice to have something I can carry it in and it doesn't look like I'm carrying some weird vial into the building that doesn't have any indication that it's salt. You know, you start pouring stuff. I, I would bring salt, salted water or Soleil water sometimes in a Ziploc bag to work. And my employees, my coworkers are looking at me like, what in the world are you pouring in your drink there? You know, because I would add it to my my San Pellegrino or whatever I was drinking that day, sometimes even the hot water that I'm having with my, in lieu of coffee, I would add a little bit of Soleil water to it. 
Well, this way I can carry some little fine salt with me and just put a little bit in my drink and it's perfect and it doesn't look weird if because I actually have a, a labeled bottle that says real salt. So be sure to check out this quick clip from Redmond and anything you buy from me, not only do you save 15% when you use my code Dante, D-A-N-T-E, but also it supports the channel. I can't tell you how much of a, a help it is because it's really what's allowing me to be able to do this closer and closer to full time. And I'm so thankful for you guys that have been coming back and watching my videos. We're approaching 38,000 subscribers. And I just couldn't have done any of this without you guys. And you guys are helping me spread the word. So here's that quick message from Redmond. And I'll see you next time. I love it just as much as I did before. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat?